During the early decades of Air Force history, there was a near constant awareness of the challenges posed by the nuclear age. The sheer destructive power of nuclear weapons resulted in an uneasy peace based on a doctrine of mutually assured destruction. The Air Force was initially the world's sole nuclear power after dropping the little man on Hiroshima, but the Soviets' test of an atomic weapon in 1949 and the war in Korea heightened tension around the world. The arms race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union during the 1950s had begun. On November 26, 1956, Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson assigned responsibility for developing intercontinental ballistic missiles to the Air Force. The service responded by activating its first ICBM wing within a year. The first ICBM was known as the Atlas. It was able to strike a targeted area up to 500 miles away. The U.S. wanted the capability to provide a quick action response and a reliable nuclear deterrent. Through a new concept that combined space technology with nuclear capability, the first ICBM was born. These missiles were fueled by mixing liquid fuel with oxidizer. ICBMs that require liquid fuel to launch are known as hypergolic missiles. Due to the delay of adding liquid fuel, the ICBMs took at least 30 minutes to prep for a launch. Other hypergolic missiles that were created after the Atlas included the Thor, the Jupiter, the Titan I, and the Titan II. As the missile systems improved, the Air Force searched for a way to launch missiles even faster. An Air Force missile designer, Colonel Edward Hall, pushed for a new concept involving solid propellant. He designed solid fuel in the late 50s, which was groundbreaking technology because it allowed for instant combustion. This eliminated the time needed to add fuel before the launch. Not only was solid fuel more responsive, but it was also more accurate, enabled the missiles to travel further distance, and it was much safer than the explosive process of mixing liquid fuel and oxidizer. By 1958, the Air Force had its first solid fuel ICBM, known as Weapon System Q. Colonel Hall changed the ICBM's name to Minuteman as a symbolic reminder of the country's military past and to reflect the quick response time of the missile system. Its ability to launch within minutes separated the Minuteman 1 missile from all previous ICBMs and paved the way for the future. The Minuteman was designed to be an efficient, reliable weapon system. It was lighter and cheaper to manufacture than other systems. Additionally, the new system could be mass-produced, be operated and maintained by small crews, and automatically monitored for condition and combat readiness. By 1965, the Air Force had an operational force of 800 Minuteman missiles located across six stateside bases. The improvements in manufacturing didn't end there. In fact, Commander of Air Force Systems Command General Bernard Schriever had come up with a more efficient way of manufacturing high-quality missiles through the idea of parallel development. He issued contracts to multiple companies for each major missile to speed up the innovation process. His idea of parallel development ensured multiple weapon systems were under research, development, and production at the same time. General Schriever is credited as the architect of the Air Force's ballistic missile and military space program. Science is dynamic and real progress must be constantly pursued. Between 1969 and 1975, the Minuteman 1 system was replaced with modernized Minuteman 2 missiles. The Minuteman 2 had improved propellant, allowing for even longer range and survivability of the system. During the replacement of the Minuteman with Minuteman 2s, the Air Force contracted Boeing for research and development of the next phase of the weapon system, Minuteman 3. Until the Minuteman 3, all previous ICBMs had one warhead that could only strike a single target. Plus, the systems were hard to retarget. Minuteman 3 had the ability to carry up to three warheads and it had rapid retargeting capability, making it easy to switch targets. This gave planners a lot of flexibility and saved time. Minuteman 3 had a better guidance system than its predecessors known as the Multiple Independent Delivery System. This made it more accurate. Because of the ability to carry three warheads, it had more than twice the blast radius and could strike targets up to 8,000 miles away. By 1977, 550 Minuteman 3s were launch ready, and the number of operational Minuteman 2s were reduced to 450. In the late 70s, the Air Force requested a more accurate and larger ICBM. By 1985, the Air Force developed an ICBM that carried 10 warheads known as the Peacekeeper. The Peacekeeper, or PK, was very responsive and accurate, but was a high maintenance ICBM. It was later deactivated in 2005, leaving the Minuteman III as the U.S.'s premier ICBM. 
Through the state-of-the-art improvements, the Minuteman system continues to evolve to meet new challenges and assume new missions. Modernization programs have resulted in new versions of the missile, expanded targeting options, improved accuracy, and survivability. Today's safe, reliable, and lethal Minuteman weapon system is the product of almost 60 years of continuous enhancement. Currently, Air Force Global Strike Command oversees the nation's 400 combat-ready ICBMs, which are the top cover for conventional forces around the world. They stand ready to deploy 24-7, 365. So right now there are 450 launch facilities in the United States. Each wing will have three squadrons, each squadron will have five launch control centers, and each control center should man 10 missiles. On a daily basis you walk into work and you know what the possibility is that uh, what could happen, but you hope for peace, plan for war. That's the way that you need to take it on every day when you're going into work. The needs of the Air Force are pretty great as far as missiles go. It's uh, it is the tier one function that we, that we provide. It allows everyone else the ability to operate because we do have that constant deterrence going on. So everything is allowed to function because of our strong nuclear presence. Nuclear deterrence is the bedrock of our national sovereignty. As long as we're in possession of these weapons and we're able to cause such irreparable damage to a potential adversary, they will have to consider their choices carefully moving forward if someone was decided to attack the United States. Some of the equipment is very old, but they have been uh, uh, refurbished quite a few times. The fact that our weapon system was fielded in the late 1960s and ceased production in 1978 and is still operational is a testament to our maintainers. The fact that we keep revitalizing how these weapons are used and how, how they're maintained. Those guys in the maintenance field are working so fast and they've got their stuff so wired tight. It's really, it's really something else to see. It's, it's pageantry with how much that they have uh, rehearsed and how well and how efficiently they can work. With the missile itself, I mean, it's about 60 feet high and you can see pictures of it, but it doesn't really do it justice until you're standing next to it. And it's really quite astounding. The, the power of these things and the destructive force of these things is, is really, really pretty impressive. My wife has a great grasp of what I do. I think she understands the gravity of the entire situation as far as what we do at this job. If it was me personally, I would know that things in the world, uh, the situation, the environment of the world is so bad that we had no other alternative but to use these. I know that what I'm doing is to protect my country and to protect the people I love. When Colonel Paul Tibbetts was piloting the Enola Gay mission, their in brief before they departed actually consisted of the mission planners telling them that the, the power of the weapon system that they're about to drop over Hiroshima could knock the Earth off its axis. So they went into that with a bit of an unknown when they were, uh, when they were prepared to carry that out, which they did. And you can imagine that would be a, uh, that would be a pretty intense experience, but zero hesitation to key turn. When people hear test launch, they're very interested in seeing the missile take off. Um, they don't really think or consider the necessary infrastructure to get signals to that missile in the first place. Um, and so really everybody's just looking for the show, right? They're looking to see the missile take off and watch it uh, go off and over the horizon. Uh, for Simulate Electronic Launch Minuteman, we provide all that kind of uh, backroom uh, stuff that you'd be look that you wouldn't necessarily see day to day. SELM is important because it underpins our nuclear deterrence and our ability to provide nuclear deterrence for our people and for our allies. Missileers are the eyes on the system. We can validate the commands are sent 
and that they're received by the launch facilities and that they're executed properly. Our role is to also validate that when the ALCS, the Alternate Launch Command System, is in the air and that they are transmitting their launch commands through the test LFs, that those transmissions are received and that they are in fact responding correctly to those tests. With the nuclear deterrence aspect of it, uh, it gives our technicians a chance to actually see, uh, no kidding, hey, this equipment actually does work. And that's a message that they can take back to their friends and family and tell them to say, hey, you know, yes, we've had this missile system around for a while, but we just don't use it when it launches. We use it every single day. And this is just one key portion of it to, to show them that when we're ready to launch, Minuteman 3 will launch.